Love's Labour's Lost is a lesser known Shakespearean comedy, very different in nature to those other comedies more favoured by modern theatres. Yes, we do have plenty of folk falling in love, including those who have been anti the whole idea in the first place. Yes, we do have disguises with typically comic consequences. Yes, we do have vibrant male-female banter. But there is very little plot and there is also an unexpectedly sombre ending. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to Love's Labour's Lost, so it doesn't matter if you have read or seen it before or not, and in particular the main character, Barone. In many ways, he is similar to Benedict from Much Ado About Nothing. He has feisty exchanges with a female counterpart. He falls in love and is known amongst his friends as being a clever so-and-so. But unlike with Benedict, I will argue, amongst other points, that Barone's obsession with language ultimately implies superficiality and negates the possibility of a happy ever after ending. I will explore his initial opposition to the King's plan to create an intellectual closeted Nirvana in Navarre and argue that his decision to sign up, in spite of so many doubts, implies that he places enormous value on his place within an all-male bonding group. He's an interesting character. Let's explore him in plenty of detail, including definitions and explanations of the effects of some of the many rhetorical devices he uses, which include anaphora, antinoclasis, antithesis, asyndeton, conjuries, epistroph, isocolon, um, polypoton and polysyndeton. This is Schofield on Shakespeare. Early impressions of, of Barone are that he is an intelligent man, not afraid to speak his mind, even if it goes against the views and ideas of the king and close friends. The play opens with the king delivering an impassioned speech in which he reveals his proposal for Navarre to be the wonder of the world through the decision of its men to devote three years to intensive study, forsaking all else, including women. Longueville and Domain make brief, aspirational, self-sacrificial speeches in which they sign up to the king's ambitious plan. Barone does not. Instead, he queries the unrealistic details of the scheme. He has no problem with living and studying with the king for three years, but declares... But there are other strict observances, as not to see a woman in that term, which I hope well is not enrolled there, and one day in the week to touch no food, and but one meal on every day beside, the which I hope is not enrolled there, and then to sleep but three hours in the night, and not to be seen to wink of all the day, and make a dark night of half the day, which I hope well is not enrolled there. These words show that Barone has an independent mind, and that he is not prepared to be swept by emotive rhetoric or undue reverence for a king into signing up to something which he doesn't fully agree with. It is clear that Barone has looked at the details of the plan and realised that they are not just likely to make him unhappy, but also that they can, may make the whole scheme unrealistic. Additionally, his own use of rhetorical devices indicate that he can use language persuasively and stylishly in order to emphasise his own arguments. His polysyndeton, the use of a conjunction, in this case and, between clauses, makes the conditions to the three-year plan seem petty, endless and absurd. And one day to touch no food, and but one meal on every day besides, and to sleep just three hours in the night, etc., Meanwhile, his use of epistrophe, the repetition of a word or phrase at the end of successive clauses, as seen when he chorus-like echoes, which I hope well is not enrolled there, hammers home his opposition to niggly, unnecessary, unachievable conditions. Barone is able to develop his ideas, to explain his resistance to the scheme in further detail. 
responding to the king's argument that vain delights, including presumably ample sleep and interaction with women, hinder study, Barone cries, and let's head to the BBC Shakespeare 1985 version, which starred Mike Willem as the argumentative bachelor. All oh, delights are vain, but that most vain, which with pain purchased doth inherit pain, as painfully to pore upon a book to seek the light of truth, while truth the while doth falsely blind the eyesight of his look. Light seeking light doth light of light beguile, so... Ere you find where light in darkness lies, your light grows dark by losing of your eyes. In this extract on screen, Barone argues that it is most vain, most of no value, to indulge in endless study and reading when it is likely to give you physical pain by irrevocably damaging your eyesight. He used antinoclasis, the repetition of a word while shifting from one of its meanings to another, by first talking of the intellectual pain purchased when investing so much time and energy into studying learned books, before moving to the consequential physical pain of eyesight strain. The word pain is heard three times in quick succession, once as part of painfully, and the effect is to claustrophobically emphasise the negative consequences of the intensive study plan. Barone also uses antinoclasis when confusingly repeating the word light seven times within the space of five lines. When he talks of the light of truth, he is referring to the shining beacon of revelatory acquisition of learning. But when he says that light seeking light doth light, light of light beguile, he uses light for a metaphor for eyes, saying that seeking illuminating knowledge can surreptitiously remove the literal light from the aforementioned eyes or light. The overall effect is to dizzy the listener with mesmerising repetition and rapid changing changes in meaning of the same word sound unit. The impression we are left with is that Barone is extraordinarily adept at using language to reinforce his ideas, ironically against academic excess, an apparent contradiction that the other characters pick up, pick up on later in the scheme when they parrot like chorus, how well he's read to reason against reading, proceeded well to stop all good proceeding, he weeds the corn and still lets grow the weeding. All three are making the point that Barone is using lavish, extravagant language and rhetorical devices, which must have involved a reasonable amount of reading and independent study to argue against something which he himself clearly values, literacy and learning. This time the rhetorical device used is polyptoton, repeating words from the same roots, i.e. read, reading, proceeded, proceeding, weeds, weeding. The king could have said, how well he's read to reason against learning as opposed to reading, but hearing, read and reading within the same balanced utterance stresses the incongruity of Barone's stance. The king's phrasing is intended to encourage the listeners to question his friend's integrity and judgment, for why would someone obviously well read want to discourage reading? Barone may be intelligent, may take the lead when it comes to using rhetoric and arguments. However, the fact that he agrees to sign the three-year pledge, irrespective of his considerable doubts, implies that remaining a vocal part of a male group is more important to him than silly vows. Following the King's sulky dismissive command for Barone to sit you out and go home, he abruptly changes his mind, telling the others that he is confident I'll keep what I have sworn and bide the penance of each three years day. These words show that Barone recognises that the pledge will involve a degree of suffering and self-sacrifice. A penance is an act that shows you feel sorry about something you have done, implying that he sees the all-encompassing quest for learning as more of a punishment than an opportunity for eternal fame. But although Barone has no intention of missing out, of leaving the tightly knit male bonding group, he remains a questioner, a leader, rather than a clueless acquiescer. Indeed, he continues to look at the details of the pledge after signing. 
Not only does he remember that the French king's daughter is imminently due to, due to discuss Aquitaine, thus making the condition of not being able to speak to women at all highly problematic, but he also reacts against conditions which smack of giggly adolescence as opposed to practical common sense and decency. He discovers that the penalty for a woman coming within a mile of my court will be on pain of losing her tongue. He asks, who devised this penalty? And on hearing that it was Longueville, he asks again, sweet lord, and why? His overall conclusion is that it is a dangerous law against gentility. Gentility refers to good manners, polite behaviour, and Barone stands alone in being able to interpret and challenge details of their elaborate scheme, which, in this case, seem misogynistic. Why should a woman be physically abused just for daring to venture near the hallowed halls of revered male learning? So, in Act 1, we are introduced to four eligible bachelors. And in Act 2, we meet four eligible ladies who are already well acquainted with the aforementioned men and indeed appear to have already chosen their favourites. Maria compliments Longueville. Catherine gushes of Dumaine. And Rosaline explains that Barone is great fun and good company. Barone, they call him. But to marry a man within the limit of becoming mirth, I never spent an hour's talk with all. So there is literally no one Rosaline has ever encountered who has made her laugh as much. She even eulogises that old people abandon what they are doing to listen to him, while younger folk are equally entranced. What is the effect of hearing the women take turns to praise the men? Well, it suggests that love may be on the way, and that the men will indeed, as Barone intimated, very quickly be forsworn. The emphasis is removed from the men as individuals, including the more interesting Barone, into being a part or illustrative of their sex. What men and women generally and naturally do is attract each other. Thus, the watching audience, hearing the ladies take turns, turns to coo and indulge in a little romantic reverie, are likely to reflect on the ridiculousness of the men's plan trying to remove or stifle this impulse, not just for one individual, but potentially four, is clearly unnatural and preposterous. And to return more precisely to our question, exploring the character of Barone, Shakespeare's positioning of two groups of four men and four women attracted to each other makes the roles of individuals, yes, including those as witty and intelligent as Barone, less significant. Arguably, we've become more interested in the scenario. So what will happen generically now that some men have embarked upon such a foolish mission than the individual's concerns? That said, Barone does stand out amongst the men for his obvious desire to consort with the opposite sex, in spite of the awkward frostiness caused by the men's decision not to allow women into the court due to their pledge. During the first meeting between the four men and four women, Barone is the only man to attempt courtly, non-business related compliments. Whereas the king can only respond to the princess's withering onslaught, complaining of the lack of appropriate welcome with feeble lines about his oath, Barone uses both his freedom from responsibility and his natural inclination for enjoyable verbal bouts with men and women to try to build a positive relationship with Rosaline. He asks her, Did not I dance with you in Brabant once? However, Rosaline merely echoes the question back at him, thus implicitly rejecting his attempt to build a connection with her through fatic talk. Her repetition makes Barone's question seem too obvious and banal, something she suggests explicitly when she says, how needless was it then to ask the question? All of Rosaline's comments aim to aggressively cut off or put down Barone. When he complains that she mustn't be so quick or hasty and impatient, Rosaline introduces imagery relating to horses. She has to be quick and hasty because he has spurred her on with such a fatuous question. Barone attempts to continue this courtly imagery and suggests that Rosaline's wit is too impatient, too quick 
and so will inevitably tire, just as a rider will inevitably wear out his horse or wit if he spurs it on too much initially. However, Rosaline develops the imagery to a finite conclusion, agreeing that perhaps the horse will be worn out, but only once it has left its rider in the mire, unseated from the horse and amidst deep, wet, sticky earth. The implication is that this would be Barone's undignified figurative state, left humiliated by her quick wit and refusal to engage positively in courtly chat. Barone's subsequent line, what time of day, is clearly an attempt to change the subject, and when this too results in a dig, the owl that fools should ask, Barone rapidly abandons the conversation altogether. The effect of this exchange is to show that Barone is not the only person capable of using language to impress and dominate, and indeed Rosaline's proficiency gives an early indication that she may, like Beatrice for Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing, be an ideal partner for Barone once the ridiculous embargo on love has been lifted. This exchange and the princess's earlier words also emphasise just how offensive the three-year pledge appears to those left firmly and patronisingly on the outside. Yet it seemed such a good idea in the beginning, to three of the men at least. It is of course unsurprising that all four men fall in love with their female counterparts, thus causing humorous problems, not just in terms of the vow they have signed up to, but also the potential to lose face amongst themselves. Barone is the first of the four to admit his feelings openly during a soliloquy in Act 3, Scene 1. That said, his extravagant rhetoric and self-conscious references to Cupid implied that he may be more in love with himself and the idea of love than Rosaline. He gushes whimsic whimsically. And let's return to the BBC production. And I, forsooth, in love. I, that have been love's whip. Or very beadle to a humorous sigh, a critic, nay, a night watch constable, a domineering pedant o'er the boy, than whom no mortal so magnificent. This wimpled, whining, purblind, wayward boy, this senior junior, giant dwarf, Dan Cupid, regent of love rhymes, lord of folded arms, the anointed sovereign of sighs and groans, liege of all loiterers and malcontents, dread prince of plackets, king of cod pieces, sole imperator and great general of trotting parators. <laughs> so Barone recognises the incongruity of him falling in love, given that he has been such a merciless, teasing thrasher of anyone else who has shown the slightest symptoms of being in love. For example, emitting a moody sigh. He metaphorically labels himself a beadle, a parish officer responsible for whipping petty criminals. And this imagery implies that he didn't let any stargaze lover within the entire community escape a withering lashing from his tongue. His reference to the boy is a reference to Cupid, the god of love, traditionally depicted as a winged infant carrying a, carrying a bow whose arrows could implant love within seconds. But Barone spends so damn long devising different descriptive tags for Cupid, he is alternatively this wimpled, whining, purblind, wayward boy, or regent of love rhymes, i.e. ruler of love poetry, or lord of all those whose behaviour is made melancholy due to love, that he doesn't even mention any personal details about Rosaline. His use of conjuries, piling up phrases for rhetorical effect, exposes him as someone more interested in the process of falling in love and eager to take full advantage of the linguistic opportunities offered, i.e. he can now even more legitimately use the most extravagant and highly embellished language. A comparison with a similar moment in Much Ado About Nothing is revealing. Benedict, like Barone, has previously railed against love and prioritised bachelor friendship groups above all else. But whereas Barone falls in love of his own accord, perhaps spurred on by the natural human impulse to rebel against oppressive constraints, Benedict is manipulated by his friends into uncovering his own feelings of love to himself. In Act 2, Scene 3 of the excellent comedy, he reflects, 
and let's switch to Branagh's 1993 film, which he directed and took the plum role of Benedict. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair, tis a truth, I can bear them witness, and virtuous, tis so, I cannot reprove it, and wise, <laughs> but for loving me, by my troth, it is no addition to her wit, nor no great argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have railed so long against marriage. But does not the appetite alter? Of course, the context, the difference. Benedict has just been told, erroneously, that Beatrice may die due to unrequited love for him. And of course, this is both hugely flattering and a gentlemanly opportunity for reciprocation. This is not the case for Barone. He has not been told that Rosaline is perilously in love with him and so in need of urgent chivalrous attentions. But even taking account of the different spurs for their feelings, there is something about the simple, humbler prose of Benedict which makes him so much more likeable than his equivalent in Love's Labels Lost, and I hope I am not just being swayed by Branagh's natural exuberance as the actor Benedict in the production, and his typically use of slushy strings in the background as the director. Whereas Benedict from Much Ado About Nothing can reflect honestly on his loved one's good qualities, agreeing wholeheartedly that she is fair, virtuous and wise, Barone prefers the orgy of implicitly self-congratulatory poetic verse and over-the-top references to Cupid. The comparison between the two plays emphasises the highly ornate artificiality of Barone's language, something a modern audience is less likely to warm to. A further comparison of the exact vows to love in the two texts emphasises these points. Whereas Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing generally chivalrously loves Barone's use of um, ascendant, missing out conjunctions between clauses, implies a formulaic adaptation of a role as opposed to genuine feeling. Barone may be self-consciously melancholy in love, but that doesn't prevent him from being able to enjoy watching others in the same plight pine and suffer. In Act 4, Scene 3, the King enters with some of his poetic love compositions. Note Barone's enthusiasm as he rejoices, rejoices to himself and the audience. Shot by heaven, proceed, sweet Cupid, thou hast thumped him with thy bird bolt under the left pap. In faith, secrets, the imperative shot and proceed and the vigorous verb thumped show his great gusto at discovering the king is in love. Once again, he returns to imagery about Cupid, whom he praises with the adjective sweet on this occasion and compliments by suggesting his blunt arrow, his bird bolt, has pierced the heart situated underneath the left breast or pap of his latest victim. At 4, scene 3 continues formulaically, with each man in turn entering to deliver soliloquies or so they think, revealing their th feelings, thus giving the earlier, subsequently hidden men the gratifying sense that not only are they not alone in being in love, but also their own feelings remain a secret, thus opening up pathways to teasing and ribbing. Here's a condensed version of how this looks in Branagh's 2000 production, which adapted the play as a classic 1930s musical. Now in thy likeness, one more fool appear.
Barone is the first to hide and thus he is the only one who knows the other three are in love and whose own feelings have not yet been uncovered. He makes frequent comments on the other men from his hiding points, thus continuing the impression of him as an irreverent, witty entertainer rather than a man left tongue-tied and melancholy by love, as is the clear case with Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing, who openly confesses, Gallants, I am not as I have been. Before lying, I have the toothache. For example, whilst Dumaine eulogises about Catherine, Barone interjects deliciously, Oh, most divine Kate, oh, most profane coxcomb, by heaven the wonder in a mortal eye, by earth she is not corporal, there you lie. Her amber hairs for foul hath amber quoted, an amber-coloured raven was well noted, as upright as the cedar, stoop, I say, her shoulder is with child. The humour lies in Barone's hyperbolic contradictions of Dumaine's lovesick proclamations, which frequently echo and mirror the latter's syntax. With the extract on screen, Barone starts by using isocolon, a phrase or clause of equal length, and antithesis, contrast in opposition, when he responds to almost divine Kate with almost profane coxcomb. A coxcomb is a fool. Someone profane is someone who shows no respect for a god. Barone's isocolon creates a mocking parrot-like effect, whilst the antithesis of divine and profane emphasises just how much beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Whilst one man may gape open-mouthed and worship, there will always be others wondering what on earth the fuss is about. Antithesis continues with Barone grounding Dumaine's heaven with a shift to earth, once again de-romanticising the notion of a perfect divinely inspired love and illustrating the fact that Barone cannot resist a quip at the expense of an old friend, particularly if it gives him an opportunity to show off to an audience his own clever way with words. So Barone seems to be more in love with the process and opportunities of romantic love rather than a particular person. He relishes opportunities for one-liners and rhetorical extravagance, although his encounters with Rosaline have suggested that she may be more his linguistic match than his three dopey male friends. And halfway through Act 14 3, he shows that he relishes opportunities to Hector, revealing himself to three sheepish lovers. He indulges. Oh, what a scene of foolery have I seen, of sighs, of groans, of sorrow and of teen. Oh me, with what strict patience have I sat, to see a king transformed to a gnat, to see great Hercules whipping a gig, and profound Solomon to tune a jig, and Nestor play at pushpin with the boys, and critic time and laugh at idle toys. Barone's... <coughs> Barone's scope of references, from the Nestor of Greek mythology to the Hercules of Roman mythology, from King Solomon from the Old Testament of the Bible to Timon the um, misanthropist of Athens, emphasise just how well-read and educated he is, thus making it easy to understand why the other men joked with him about his seeming opposition to the three-year famed study plan. His intelligence is also revealed in the seamless way he references great heroes and classical figures and assigns them wholly mundane activities or transformations. Nestor was a Greek commander famed for his wisdom, whilst Timon was no notorious for his misanthropy. Yet the former is ludicrously referred to as playing a flicking pin in children's game, and the latter is depicted chuckling at pointless games, idle toys. Barone's implication is that the three lovers have lost credibility and dignity, as well as doing something which contradicts their public reputation by being found to have broken their pledges. Indeed, Barone even has the audacity to suggest that the very king has been transformed to a gnat, i.e. transformed to something utterly insignificant. The overall impression of Barone here is of a man determined to enjoy the temporary power he has attained over three men. Given that one of them is a king, it is unsurprising that he wants to take full advantage of this. Of course, Barone gets found out, 
when one of his own love letters to Rosaline is uncovered. Once the teasing stage has been passed, it is noticeable that the other men defer to his um, intellectualism and wit to justify their abandonment of the original pledge. Even the king defers to his judgment, begging his subordinate to then leave this chat and, good Barone, now prove our loving lawful and our faith not torn. This is virtually impossible. How can you make loving lawful when just a few days previously you have passed the law explicitly banning it for the period of three years? To prove is to demonstrate by logic, by using reasoned arguments. And so the implication of the king's request is that language, when used by such a skillful practiser as Barone, has the potential to circumvent laws, to twist difficult situations to your own advantage. Language can thus be seen more than a simple means of communication, but as a weapon to distort. Of course, Barone rises to the challenge, conveniently branding the original vow flat treason against the kingly state of youth. This suggests that the vow was actually worthy of being punishable by death, the crime for plotting against a king, because it failed to take account of the men's youth and youth's natural dispositions. And after pointing out the limitations of learning derived solely from books, which restricts understanding by closing off learning from life and love. Barone ends with a rousing speech, which emphasises that for so many reasons and sakes, wisdom, love, men and women, the men simply must renege on their oaths and pursue their loves to their natural conclusions. He cries, for wisdom's sake, a word that all men love, or for love's sake, a word that loves all men, or for men's sake, the authors of these women, or women's sake, by whom we men are men, let us once lose our oaths to find ourselves, or else we lose ourselves to keep our oaths. According to Barone's use or misuse, depending on your perspective of language and rhetoric, if they do not break their oaths, they will lose their very identities and humanness, for humans of mating age naturally must love, must be attracted to others and must act on these impulses. His use of anaphora, beginning a series of clauses with the same word, relentlessly ushers in multiple compelling reasons for why they must pursue their love, for love's sake, or for men's sake, or for women's sake. Meanwhile, the use of isocolon in the beautifully balanced phrases reinforces the natural symmetry between male-female relationships, we fit together perfectly within sexual intercourse to create a whole and the prospects of new life, just as each line syntactically fits together perfectly with each other, and also creates a pleasingly ordered effect within which disingenuous, morally dubious sentiments are less likely to be suspected. Branagh's 2000 interpretation includes much of Barone's impassioned, persuasive speech, although not the extract just shown on screen. Have a look at what happens when he gets to line 319 of Act 4, Scene 3. And when love speaks, the voice of all the gods make heaven drowsy with the harmony. Heaven. I mean, heaven. And my heart beats so that I can hardly speak. And I seem to find the happiness I seek. When we're up together dancing cheek to cheek heaven i'm in heaven and the cares that hang around me through the week. so this interpretation sees barone inspired by the shakespearean line make heaven drowsy with the harmony so that he breaks out into harmony if that's a fair way of describing his and his peers as largely tuneless singing, and literally heads towards the heavens by flying up to the ceiling. It's not my favourite production. In the closing stages of the play, 
the men reveal their loves, but are taken aback when they're not taken seriously, with the women quite rightly unconvinced by the former's feelings, given their publicly proclaimed pledge and curious visit to see them disguised as Russians earlier in Act 5, Scene 2. The revelation of the death of the princess's father further accentuates the surprisingly sombre mood, not in fitting with your typical happy ever after, let's all get married Shakespearean comedy. The women set the men year-long challenges. Here's what Rosaline says to Barone. You shall this twelve-month term from day to day visit the speechless sick and still converse with groaning wretches, and your task shall be with all the fierce endeavour of your wit to enforce the pained impotent to smile. These words show Rosaline appreciating Barone's gifts with language, as shown in the reference to the fierce endeavour of his wit. However, the implication is that his language, and therefore person, may lack a certain humanity, that it is largely superficial and weaker for it. The command for Barone to put his linguistic talent to use to help those much less fortunate than himself and his complacent male peer group is likely to change his character and make him more than an ingenious upper-class quipper who worked admirably hard learning his rhetorical devices at grammar school, but a more rounded, compassionate human being. If, of course, he is able to complete the challenge, Shakespeare doesn't tell us, but there will be plenty in the audience somewhat doubting it. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production exploring the character of Barone in Love's Labour Loss, live from the top of Pico Rivo in Madeira. Many thanks for watching.